I recently watched Conchita Wurst, the alter ego of Austrian Thomas Neuwirth, push the boundaries of, of gender identity at a Eurovision song contest back in Copenhagen, which, which boasted some 180 million television viewers. Worst who won was roundly lauded for his courage in forwarding the normalcy of transgenderism, which continues to lag behind the growing acceptance of lesbian, gay, and bisexual identities. Sporting sensually highlighted eyes, a heavy dose of lipstick, cheekbones accentuated through an ample volume of makeup, and a gorgeous spaghetti strap dress, the bearded drag queen championed progressive ideals of Western civilization against the backward tyranny of Eastern powers such as Russia, which stereotypically views the LGBTQ community or movement as a, a prime example of spiritual decay taking place in Western Europe as well as of course, in America. Shortly after seeing Conchita win the Eurovision Song Contest, I read a Kansas City Star account of a happy, kind, sweet, considerate six-year-old named A.J., who had been determined to be transgender. The rough-and-tumble kid who once sported buzz cuts and dressed for his birthday as a pirate was growing her chestnut hair down below her shoulders. A.J. was now a girl. The narrative was crystal clear. Those who would so much as bat an eye at the determination of a six-year-old boy to become a girl are like the bigots who once fueled the fires of racism in America. The arc of history Upon the star, is moving quickly toward both greater tolerance as well as greater acceptance, an acceptance enhanced by Bruce Jenner's public transgenderism. Thus, the question that inevitably arises is this. How shall we then live? Well, I've codified my response using the acronym GAY, first the G. God has spoken. The Bible is crystal clear respecting gender-bending activities. To begin with, the New Testament derives its proscriptions against same-sex sexuality from the creation order of Genesis as well as the prohibitions of Leviticus. Furthermore, Scripture contends that wholly apart from access to special revelation, like the Bible, general revelation provides sufficient evidence to underscore God's condemnation of same-sex sexuality. Finally, we would do well to recognize that the Bible does not condemn same-sex sexuality in an arbitrary or in a capricious fashion. Rather, it carefully defines the borders of human sexuality so that our joy may be complete. A. Adjust your attitude. In place of a we-they-siege mentality, Christians must commit themselves to becoming salt and light and then to do so with gentleness and with respect. The God-hates-fags mentality is more conducive to repelling than reaching a culture steeped in sin and confusion. As Joe Dallas has rightly said, we can preach the right things in all the wrong ways, either too aggressively or too meekly. When either conviction or compassion is being compromised, a revision is in order. Tolerance when it comes to personal relationships is a virtue, but tolerance when it comes to Truth is a travesty. Yield not. We must never yield our consciences to the subtle lure of political correctness. Rather, we ought to say, 
my conscience is captive to the Word of God, and thus to go against my conscience is never right and is clearly not safe. The temptation to yield to cultural norms will continue to be pressed upon us with increasing ferocity. Yet to yield is to abandon the very call that God has placed upon our collective lives. This is no trifling matter. It is a matter of natural law. As Dr. J. Richards has rightly said, to deny natural law is to strike a mortal blow to the foundation of a free society. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15.